Lisa McVeigh was unhappy from the very beginning. One day, she decided to end it all and settle the score with life. On that very day she planned her suicide, she encountered a sadistic serial killer. He would change her life, and she would change his. Lisa McVeigh was born into a very poor and troubled family in Tampa, Florida. At the age of five, Child Protective Services took her away from her parents and placed her in an orphanage. The girl was later taken from the orphanage by her grandmother. Lisa was brought to her grandmother's home, where she lived with her partner, who soon began to harass the girl. She endured the abuse for over three years. Lisa was not accustomed to sharing with anyone or complaining to anyone, and she kept even these horrible things to herself. She was very closed off, always alone, and no one knew about the terrible experiences happening inside the girl. In November 1984, 17-year-old Lisa decided that she could no longer live with this burden. Her grandmother's partner continued his abuse. On the morning of November 2nd, Lisa got up, washed up as usual, trying to do everything quietly to avoid unnecessary attention. Everything was as usual, except for one thing, she sat down to write a suicide note. After finishing it, she felt the long-awaited relief inside. Soon, she would put an end to all this. She would put an end to the pain she had endured throughout her childhood. She went to work and waited for the evening to kill herself. She was thrilled with anticipation. It seemed like her only happy day in a very long time, and she decided to live it to the fullest. At that time, Lisa worked at a donut shop. On November 2nd, she worked two shifts and stayed until 2 in the morning. She left the store and headed to her bike. One of her colleagues offered to give her a ride home. Lisa said everything was fine and she would ride home herself. As she rode home, her small bag lay in the front basket of her bike, containing a couple of jelly donuts, and Lisa felt incredibly happy. She imagined eating them and then shooting herself in the head. The road was dark and empty, fresh but not cold. Lisa sped up and rode very fast. Joy overwhelmed her, she felt free like a bird. On the way, she saw a huge beautiful church. In the church parking lot was a car with dark burgundy spokes on the wheels, and the rear tire on the driver's side looked strange, almost flat. Lisa found it very surprising. She stopped pedaling and slowed down, and then someone grabbed her hand, and the bike tipped over. Lisa fell and immediately saw the barrel of a gun pointed at her head. At that moment, Lisa couldn't imagine what dangerous person fate had brought her encounter on the dark road near the church. She couldn't even guess where all this would lead. The streets of Tampa had recently become a hunting ground for a serial killer. The murders began with 22-year-old exotic dancer Ginty Long, nicknamed Lana. On May 13, 1984, local teenagers walking along an abandoned road found her body. The crime scene was horrifying. The victim was completely naked. In the investigation of the murder, detectives should not be surprised at what one person can do to another. But here we are talking about unimaginable cruelty. On the muddy sand near Lana's body, detectives found tire tracks. The pattern imprint of one tire tread was completely different from the imprint of the other three. It was a tire made by hand, and such tires were standard equipment on new Cadillac models. Two weeks later, in a field near the highway, a road worker found another victim. It was 22-year-old Michelle Sims. She also had a rope around her neck. The murder was no less cruel than Lana Long's. The cruelty with which the murders took place indicated that they were committed by a person who fiercely hated women. The murders were not identical but similar enough. Tiny red fibers were found on both victims. The police sent the fibers to the FBI laboratory. The analysis results showed that these were the same fibers, particles from automotive nylon carpeting. Several carpet samples were sent to the laboratory to determine the brand, but each of them came back with a negative result. It was like looking for a needle in a haystack. Investigators had no single lead. On September 7th, the body of 21-year-old Vicki Mary Elliott was discovered, again with almost no clues. On October 7th, 1984, a call came into the police station. A new body was found. 
The victim was 18-year-old Chanel Williams. She was found on a ranch, beaten, raped, and shot in the back of the head. Her body was left under the fence. The police hoped that no more crime scenes would be needed to complete the investigation. But the killer was cautious, he left no evidence. Contrary to all hopes, bodies of two more women were discovered in October. On October 14th, Carrie Desfont, and on October 31st, Kimberly Halls. The victims were appearing faster and faster. He wouldn't give up. He would continue killing, he was good at it. Without a doubt, he was a serial killer with sadistic tendencies. The police worked, hoping to stop the serial killer. But his next victim was Lisa McVeigh. As Lisa lay on the asphalt, she screamed. He loudly said four times, shut up. Lisa's grandmother's partner pointed a gun at her in the same way. She thought this man wanted the same thing. She told him, I'll do whatever you want. Just don't kill me. Lisa stopped thinking about suicide. She wanted to live more than ever. He threw her into his car and tied her up. When he blindfolded her, she clenched her jaw and squinted as hard as she could, so when she relaxed her face, there was a small space at the bottom. She could see. Lisa began looking for any identifying signs she could later report to the police if she could escape. She examined the car. She saw green digital clocks, white leather upholstery, red carpeting in front and behind, thick carpeting that didn't look like ordinary car carpeting. On the dashboard, Lisa noticed the word Magnum. He ordered her to undress, and she did. Then he said that as long as she did what he wanted, he wouldn't kill her. Then he started the car, left the parking lot, and headed onto the interstate highway. For a while, he drove on it, and then he turned off the main road. About 30 minutes later, they stopped. There were only trees around. They were in the woods. Lisa thought, this is it. The end. He will rape and kill me. He took Lisa out of the car. She counted each step. She took 18 steps before stepping onto a staircase with 19 steps. They entered a building. Lisa saw a mostly green carpet with yellow and red spots on the floor. They went upstairs, made a quick left turn, then a quick right turn. They were in his apartment. It smelled of fresh paint, cleanliness. He led Lisa to the bathroom, untied the ropes, removed the blindfold, telling her not to open her eyes. But in a fraction of a second, she noticed that he had short chestnut hair. He told her to stand in the shower. Then he washed her, very gently, with special care. It seemed like he lived in his own fantasy, and she seemed real to him. When Lisa got out of the shower, she dared to ask, Why are you doing all this? He replied, I hate women. I went through a tough breakup. And then Lisa thought it was a great opportunity to get closer to him. She decided to treat him as if he deserved love, to make him feel wanted. Of course, to survive. Afterward, he told Lisa to dry her hair with a hairdryer. Whatever he asked her to do, she did. She kept thinking, okay, I'll play on his emotions and make it so that I earn his trust. Then the first assault happened. He threw her on the bathroom floor and raped her. He was very cruel, but for Lisa, it was nothing new. Since she was two, she had been subjected to physical and later sexual violence. She understood that if she resisted, she would be killed. Then he seemed to calm down. Lisa dared to ask him for the opportunity to use the bathroom. She said she couldn't do it with the door open. He closed the door, and Lisa thought she needed to leave her fingerprints everywhere, on the toilet seat, on the sink, on the bathroom walls. She wanted the police, when everything was revealed, to know that he really kept her in this apartment. A few minutes later, the man led Lisa out of the bathroom, reminding her not to open her eyes. He took her to the supposed bedroom and told her to stay there. He left, and Lisa, for a few seconds, opened her eyes. The light from the bathroom illuminated the room. She saw red digital clocks, a fan. And then he appeared in the room. He stood behind her, blindfolded her again, tied her wrists and legs, threw Lisa on the bed. 
he climbed over her and ran a black revolver over her stomach, indicating that he still had the weapon and that he was ready, despite going to sleep. Lisa heard him snoring. She wondered if it was real snoring or fake. Was he really sleeping or pretending? Lisa decided not to take any risks and froze next to her assailant. At that time, the police continued their work. The FBI joined the investigation, creating a presumed psychological profile. In the FBI, this is called Criminal Investigative Analysis, CIA, or Profiling. The serial killer's profile was as follows. It was believed that he was a lonely person, unemployed, or frequently changing jobs. The FBI believed that the killer was methodical and organized. He kept track of the news, left no evidence, and would be difficult to catch. This was a killer who had no intention of stopping. He moved around a lot in his car. He loved his car, it was his identity. Investigators believed the car was a key part of the investigation. Fabric fibers, tire prints, they needed to find this car. Detectives began patrolling the Tampa area where the victims lived. Undercover people worked in the parking lots of large establishments. Prostitutes actively collaborated with the police. They were always the best sources of information. They talked about regulars, but there were no matches. The whole investigation seemed like chasing a shadow. While investigators were searching for the maniac, Lisa experienced the unimaginable. For 10 hours, he assaulted her with short breaks for sleep. Lisa didn't focus on that. She concentrated on staying alive. Once, he took her by the hand and led her to another room. She heard him preparing something, probably a sandwich. Then she heard him open a carbonated drink. She wanted to drink but didn't show it. The TV in the room was on, and Lisa heard the news that 17-year-old Lisa was missing. She started to panic. She began to cry and scream. He pointed the gun at her head and said, If you scream again, I'll have to shoot you in the head. Stop crying. Lisa noticed that he said I'll have to, maybe he didn't want to, this calmed her. She realized that allowing hysteria was a mistake, it shouldn't happen again. They returned to the bedroom. At some point, he asked her what her name was. She lied and said the name Carol. He asked her to describe the girls from the high school and how their bodies looked when they changed in the gym. Lisa made up details on the spot, playing his games with apparent enthusiasm to be on his side and not upset him. She recalled her grandmother's partner. One wrong word, one detail, and her partner would beat her. The rapist seemed to start treating her not as a victim but as a person. He began asking about her family. Here, too, Lisa made everything up. She told him a story about her father being very ill, and she was the only caregiver for him, and he needed her. She remembered that he hated women, so she mentioned her father. She treated him with the respect he sought. There were moments when he flew into a rage, and moments when he was as kind as a puppy. She had to keep him on an even keel, not make him so upset, avoid sharp mood swings, she had to maintain his calmness. She spoke to him as if he were her little favorite child and it seemed to work. At one point, lying in bed, he took her hand and pressed it to his face. Trimmed nape, mustache, small ears, pimples on the skin, a button nose, not heavy. He smelled of soap. He was always very clean. Lisa had never seen his face with her eyes, but she saw it with her hands. Lisa realized that he was starting to trust her. A call came into the police office. FBI agents called and reported that in Elizabeth Loundenbeck's case, fibers of a red nylon carpet were found. The body of 22-year-old Elizabeth Loundenbeck was found in an orange grove five months earlier. Elizabeth Loundenbeck was not naked, she was not tied up, no rope around her neck. She was neither a prostitute nor a dancer, she was a rather shy girl who loved to read. It seemed like a case that, as the police thought, had nothing to do with the previous crimes, but now the connection was established. Elizabeth's credit card was used immediately after her disappearance. Perhaps this meant that whoever killed her took the card and used it to withdraw money. Her credit card was taken by an ATM because her account was blocked. 
When a young woman is killed out of anger, there is a very high chance that her boyfriend did it. Brooks McKinney became a suspect in Elizabeth Loudenbeck's murder. Police talked to some of his friends, and they said their relationship was complicated, and they argued a lot, mostly about money. Now the police had a motive, Elizabeth could have been killed, and her card used, which didn't seem like the previous murders. However, maybe Brooks McKinney lived with her, killed her over money or in a fit of anger, while the other unknown girls became victims of a completely different kind. Brooks McKinney was brought to the precinct and then interrogated. He said he had the PIN code for Elizabeth's card and had used it in the past. He used it this time too, but Elizabeth wasn't with him. He was nervous and didn't go into details. Something seemed fishy here. Detectives asked Brooks McKinney to take a polygraph test. Brooks agreed, but not all his answers were truthful. His alibi was that he was at a party. Police interviewed other people who were there, and they confirmed his alibi. It was impossible to match Brooks McKinney with any physical evidence from the crime scene. The police had no evidence against him. They were stuck again. Lisa endured her 24th hour of captivity. At 4 in the morning, he woke up. The first thing he said was, what should I do with you? It's like this, I kidnapped you, did all these horrible things to you, but what should I do with you now? Lisa replied, listen, I'll be your girlfriend. I'll take care of you. I'll do everything you want. No one will ever know how we met. He fell to the floor. It seemed like desperation. He kept saying, I just can't leave you here. I can't keep you here. The man got up and left for a few minutes. He came back with women's clothing. He handed Lisa an elongated women's shirt and told her to get dressed. He promised her he would take her home. It had been 26 hours since her captivity. From the moment Lisa dressed and got into the car, everything was like a blur. He asked her where she lived. Lisa told him she lived in the Westwood area. Fifteen minutes later, they stopped at an ATM. Lisa, with her eyes blindfolded, glimpsed his silhouette as he got out of the car. Lisa could have tried to escape, but she waited. The kidnapper returned to the car after a few minutes. He started the car, and they drove on. Through a gap, Lisa saw two hotels, Howard Johnson and Quality Inn. It was amazing. She knew where she was, everything was as usual, but for her, it felt like several decades had passed in these 26 hours. He asked her where to go next, along the highway or turn towards Hillsboro and Rome. He turned onto the road leading to Hillsboro. He stopped, grabbed Lisa's hands, hugged her, and said, I'm sorry, you had to go through this. I'm so sorry. He got out of the car, opened the door, and let Lisa out. She heard his last words, give me five minutes, and you can take off the blindfold. When Lisa finally removed the blindfold, she saw she was standing under a huge spreading oak tree. Then she told herself, now I'll have a new life, and it will be better. Lisa ran. Every time she heard the sound of a car, she hid, afraid he would come back for her. Then she resumed running. She finally returned to her grandmother's house. She knocked on the door, and her old abuser, her grandmother's partner, opened it. He grabbed her by the hair and threw her to the ground. He beat Lisa, then brought her into the house and interrogated her for about five hours. All this time, between questions, he beat her. He screamed, trying to find out where she had been and why she betrayed him. Lisa told him what had happened to her, begged him to believe. The partner didn't believe her, and the grandmother seemed indifferent. She called the Tampa police and said, don't worry about the missing Lisa McVeigh anymore. She's home. She made up some story about being kidnapped. But the police were deeply concerned and demanded that Lisa come to the station. At the police station, Lisa told her story to a female detective. Her behavior was so calm that the detective thought the girl in front of her was lying. Lisa couldn't take it and demanded to bring someone else. Lisa repeated the same story to Sergeant Larry Pinkerton in charge of sexual crimes. He was stunned. He stood up and left the interrogation room. Lisa heard him say to someone in another room, I believe her. Call the FBI. 
Sergeant Pinkerton contacted the Hillsborough County Sheriff, who was investigating these murders, and said, We think the guy who kidnapped Lisa McVeigh is your serial killer. On the same day, Lisa told Sergeant Pinkerton about what had also happened to her at home. The shocked police officer couldn't believe that Lisa, escaping from one abuser, ran to another, but everything the girl said turned out to be true. They arrested the grandmother's partner, and Lisa was placed in a center for runaway teens. Thus began Lisa's long collaboration with the police. She told about the magnum inscription on the car's dashboard, where they were heading, the red carpet in the car, stairs in the backyard, the apartment, fingerprints in the bathroom, and even his face that she managed to touch. The fibers found on Lisa's clothes were sent to the FBI laboratory. The FBI compared the fragments of red nylon carpet found on Lisa with the series of murders. The match was 100% with the fibers found on other victims. Armed with information from Lisa, investigators began a massive manhunt. They were looking for a Dodge Magnum because in 1984 there was only one type of car with the word Magnum on the dashboard. Police checked everyone who owned a Magnum in Hillsboro at that time. Lisa mentioned that before releasing her, the assailant stopped at an ATM. In this particular area, there were several bank branches. Police obtained surveillance camera records and a list of those who used the ATM on the night Lisa was released. Investigators compared the two lists, looking at those who used the ATM and the list of Dodge Magnum owners in that area or nearby. They found a single match, 31-year-old Robert Joe Long, or Bobby, an unemployed radiographer who was on both lists. Once they identified him, they began surveillance. Unfortunately, while they were figuring out his identity, he managed to kill two more women, Virginia Johnson and Kim Swan. He was becoming faster and more insatiable. They pulled over Bobby Long's red Dodge Magnum. Police told him they were investigating a robbery, and this car matched the description of the robber's vehicle. Bobby Long allowed himself to be photographed, and he was released, but, of course, surveillance continued. His photo was shown to Lisa among five others. She picked him, saying, he kidnapped me. Investigators obtained a search warrant for Long's apartment and car. In his bathroom, they found Lisa's fingerprints, and in the apartment, they found murder weapons, a knife, and a revolver. In Long's car, they discovered red fibers that were very close in structure to the fibers found on each of the victims. Later, the FBI confirmed their molecular level identity. Robert Joseph Long was born on October 14, 1953, in Canova, West Virginia. His parents, Luella and Joe, divorced when Bobby was a little boy, and he spent most of his childhood with his mother in Florida. Robert recalled that life with his father was filled only with fear. Robert suffered from a genetic condition characterized by an extra X chromosome. His glands produced an excessive amount of estrogen during puberty, causing his chest to enlarge. He underwent surgery to remove the extra tissue from his chest. Throughout his life, he harbored hatred towards his mother, Luella, who worked in a bar, often wore provocative clothing, and brought various men home leading a promiscuous lifestyle. She shared a bed with her son until he reached the age of 13. Bobby Long himself claimed that his mother entertained numerous lovers on that bed in their one-bedroom apartment while he slept nearby. Robert met his future wife, Cynthia, at the age of 13. They married seven years later, in 1974, and soon had two children. Their marriage was tumultuous, marked by frequent arguments and separations, but they always ended up back together. During their married life, Robert was involved in a serious accident. He was hit by a car while riding his motorcycle. In the fall, he broke his helmet, hitting his head on the asphalt. While in the hospital, he alternated between blinding headaches, unpredictable rage, and sexual obsession. Later, Cynthia claimed that after the accident, Robert's character changed. He was always irritable, but now he became physically cruel to her and impatient with the children. Cynthia filed for divorce in 1980, and Robert moved in with a friend, Sharon Richards, who later accused him of rape and assault. In the fall of 1983, 
Robert Long was accused of sending inappropriate sexual letters and photographs to a 12-year-old girl in Florida, for which he received a short prison sentence. Things only got worse from there. He would find signs saying for sale on houses or look for ads in newspapers selling furniture and other household items. Posing as an interested buyer, he would enter the house. Once inside, he would look around, and if the woman in the house was alone, he would attack. According to the police, during that period, Bobby Long committed more than 50 rapes. Long himself claimed that he raped over 150 women. He stated that he became a rapist in response to ads back in 1975. He clearly took pride in this and the fact that they couldn't catch him for so long. Long moved to the Tampa area in 1983. In the spring of 1984, Long committed his first murder. Initially, just seeking to satisfy his sexual needs, Long picked up a young prostitute named Artis and Wick in March 1984. After the sexual act, he decided he wasn't satisfied, so he strangled her. Unlike the 50 or more women raped by Long, his murder victims were mostly prostitutes or other women he deemed behaving inappropriately. On average, he committed a murder every two weeks. Later, it became more frequent. Of the known victims, five were identified as prostitutes, two as exotic dancers, one was a factory worker, and two were students. Some he strangled, others he slashed their throats or beat them to death. On November 16, 1984, investigators arrested and interrogated Bobby Joe Long. He confessed to raping and kidnapping Lisa. He said he didn't want to hurt her. They placed photos of all the previous murder victims in front of him, and he admitted to killing them all. Lisa was the final chapter. Lisa the hero. Who knows how many victims this girl saved. Lisa was taken in by her Aunt Carol and Uncle Charlie. They were the only people who ever showed her love. Thoughts of suicide never returned. Robert or Bobby Joe Long was sentenced to 28 life imprisonments and one death sentence. In 2005, Lisa received a Hillsborough County Deputy Sheriff badge. Now she drives a large white patrol car with a badge on her chest. Lisa says, when I see a victim, I take them by the hands and tell them, now it's my turn, now you're safe. I want to do everything in my power to protect people. On May 23, 2019, 65-year-old Robert Joe Long was scheduled for execution. On that day, he had his last meal at 9.30 a.m. local time. He asked for roast beef, bacon, french fries, and soda. Lisa, wearing a t-shirt with a tree print, sat in the front row when his execution began at 6.43 p.m. I wanted to be the first person he sees, said Lisa McVeigh, at that time Lisa Noland. Unfortunately, he didn't open his eyes. After the execution, she said she would have liked to hear the final words of her assailant. Long was given the opportunity to say his last words, but he chose to remain silent. Then the lethal drug combination was administered. The doctor began examining him at 6.54 p.m. and officially declared his death a minute later. After the execution, Lisa McVeigh Noland, Hillsborough County Deputy Sheriff, said, I swear to continue and be a fair voice. She insisted that she had forgiven Long a long time ago. My life changed forever and for the better. I decided not to remain a victim. I decided to live. I have children, a beloved job, friends. Robert Joe Long languished on death row for 34 years, one of the longest periods ever spent on death row in Florida.